everyone. Welcome to the Story Trading uh, Weekly Meetup. Uh, tonight we have management from Lucid Diagnostics, ticker symbol LUCD. Uh, before we do that, just our quick disclaimer, Story Trading is not an investment advisor. Uh, that goes for me and any of our guests, unless stated otherwise. Investing in securities involves significant risk of loss. We are recording. This presentation will be made available to our VIP members exclusively for the next seven days and then posted up on social media in whole or in part. So uh, there's Lucid Diagnostics. We got the CEO, Lee Sean Akbog here, CFO, Dennis McGrath. Uh, again, ticker symbol LUCD. Market cap roughly around $90 million. Last trade, $2.37. You can see the chart here. And as always at Story Trading, what we try to do is understand uh, the price action behind the chart. What's causing this? What are what are the fundamentals? The sentiment. You know, these are four pillars of story trading: fundamental, sentiment, catalyst, and technicals. And through our collaborative research in our community and talking to management, we can understand the big picture of why stock is priced at where it's at, and give us a better opportunity to kind of anticipate inflection points, which is what we like to do. So I'm going to set you up like this, Lushan. Uh, on the Earnings press release last week. There was a statement right at the top uh, that came from me that says uh, the past, this past quarter and recent weeks have been a transform transformational period for Lucid. So welcome uh, to the show, Leishan. Uh, that caught my attention. You know, we try to invite companies here who are near inflection points. So we'd love to hear more about uh, what you do and uh, where you're at and. Uh, hopefully, I got a couple of good questions for you as well at the end. Great. Hey, well, <clears throat> thanks, Ben. It's um, great to be here. Thanks for having us and look forward to <clears throat> a very um, robust conversation today. And I appreciate everybody who's joining us as well. And uh, I'm actually glad you uh, picked that quote because hopefully um, after some background, we'll be able to get into the meat of um, of, of why we feel that way as to um, uh, that this has been, in fact, a transformational period in the future uh, for this company is, is bright. Um, so let me just start with some background. I'm just going to uh, basically tell the story and um, um, uh, in some depth and then have um, some opportunity for questions later. So Lucid Diagnostics is a commercial stage a medical diagnostics company. Uh, we were founded in uh, 2018 um, <clears throat> based on technology that was licensed from Case Western Reserve University. And we are entirely focused on one thing, which is to um, address the fact that there are tens of millions of people out there in this country who have chronic heart heartburn, a very common condition, and are at risk of developing esophageal cancer. And our mission is to prevent those deaths from cancer uh, uh, through early detection of esophageal precancer. Um, let's dive a little bit into the, into the clinical aspects of this for a second. Um, esophageal um, cancer, also known as esophageal adenocarcinoma, is a really bad actor. It's the second most lethal cancer we have, only second to pancreatic cancer. Um, it carries an effective death sentence on diagnosis, about an 80% mortality. And, <clears throat> and what's fundamentally different about it compared to other common, more commonly known cancers is that um, it carries, in, in addition to most people presenting in stage three and stage four, which contributes to that mortality, it... Um, Picking up stage one cancer still carries about a 50% mortality. And that's in, um, in very stark contrast to other common cancers like colon and breast and others where if we can pick up a stage one cancer, that's considered the victory. That's an early detection with an opportunity for a cure in the 90 plus percent range. It's not the, not the case here. So we have to detect this at an earlier stage, in a pre-cancer stage, in order to have the opportunity to do something about it and prevent these deaths. Couple of other, one other couple of the key points. One is that esophageal cancer has grown by 500%, five fold in the last four, 40 years. Um, so it's, it's the, by far, in a way, the fastest uh, growing cancer in terms of its incidence over, the, over that period of time when every other cancer has remained mostly flat and many cancers have declined uh, over that years, particularly in terms of deaths. Um, that's likely related to the fact that it's associated with chronic heartburn or GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which has tracked the obesity epidemic. Um, but the bottom line is we're, there are 16,000 people who die every year of esophageal uh, cancer, and every single one of those is a tragedy. 
uh, and it's a tragedy. Obviously, all deaths are tragedies, all cancer deaths are tragedy. But this is a unique tragedy because those are they're preventable. And they're preventable because we have the ability to monitor people who, if we can identify precancer, we can monitor them and treat them with existing minimally invasive procedures to um, prevent them from developing cancer and, and dying. Um, so why aren't we doing that? We're not doing that historically because unlike other cancers that we know really well, like breast cancer, colon cancer, cervical cancer, where there are existing widespread tools that are widely utilized to uh, for early detection. So breast cancer, it's obviously mammography, colon, colon cancer, it's colonoscopy and stool tests like Cologuard. Um, uh, for uh, cervical cancer, it's pap testing and HPV testing. And so for all those other cancers, there are, are significant, um, we've had significant inroads in widespread screening and that's resulted in 50% decreases in death rates. We haven't had that in esophageal cancer until recently, until Lucid. Um, prior to the, the launch of our products, the only available technology for uh, screening of patients who are known to be at risk is endoscopy. Um, upper endoscopy is invasive. It requires two people to take the, the day off work. It requires an intravenous anesthesia. anesthesia. And despite the fact that <clears throat> people who are, despite the fact that the major um, uh, professional societies have recommended that um, a target population of tens of millions of people be screened, less than 5% um, of them are actually being screened with upper endoscopy. That's in contrast to colonoscopy, which is uh, where the rates are about 70%. So uh, for example, Cologuard is competing for that additional 30% of that business. Um, so despite that, um, endoscopy has failed as a screening modality, and there has been a, a a um, demand for an alternative to endoscopy and our products at Lucid Diagnostics serve that role. So what are those products? There are two products. One is called ESOGARD and one is called ESOCHECK. ESOGARD is a modern day next generation sequencing molecular diagnostic test. It's performed at a central laboratory in, um, in Irvine, Orange County, California. <clears throat> and it basically takes cells from the esophagus and establishes whether there is evidence of uh, DNA changes that correlate with esophageal precancer and conditions along the spectrum. Uh, it's highly accurate. It was a paper published in a prestigious journal, Science Translational Medicine, a seminal paper that showed uh, over 90% sensitivity and specificity, um, the, the measures of accuracy of the test. Um, the second key component of this is a device called ESOCHECK. ESOCHECK is the way that the cells in the lower esophagus are sampled. Unlike an endoscopy, it only requires a five, we say five minutes, it's actually closer to two to three minute procedure, uh, where in an office, no anesthesia, uh, with by a nurse or some other uh, trained professional, um, cells in the esophagus can be sampled uh, and sent for ESOGARD testing. Um, so as a result, we now for the first time have the first and only commercially available test that can, in a highly accurate way, identify whether precancer exists in this target population of about 30 million uh, patients who are well established and by all criteria are recommended for screening. So that's where we are today with regard to the products. How are we? As I mentioned, we're commercial stage. So let's talk a little bit about about how we've how we've proceeded to commercialize uh, the products. The uh, the the ESOGARD assay is available as a laboratory developed test in our central laboratory in Irvine, California. ESOCHECK is 510K cleared by the FDA. Um, we have launched a, a commercial strategy that focuses on two targets. Uh, one are primary care physicians and the other are specialists and in institutions and they're somewhat different sales channels for both. Um, the key is really the primary care physician route because most patients with longstanding heartburn are just taking over-the-counter medications, Tom's, Prilosec, et cetera, and they're not in any way um, engaged with gastroenterologists or other specialists. So the key target is for us to go to primary care physicians and, and let them know that there is this new test uh, that can um, detect esophageal precancer in their patients and prevent esophageal cancer deaths. Um, the 
the way we've um, uh, to, the way we do target those primary care physicians is we've established a network of sales representatives. Our sales direct sales team has grown um, rapidly over the last few quarters, and we're targeting um, uh, to hit sixty um, uh, members of the commercial team, including forty uh, reps uh, across the country who are calling on primary care physicians. We've also established a network of what we call lucid test centers, and these are centers where the primary care physician can send their patient um, just by clicking on their electronic health, health record for this test, no different than if they were ordering uh, an echocardiogram, a CAT scan, a chest X-ray, or even a blood test. And we have um, uh, established test centers where uh, nurse practitioners that we hire uh, and are experts at performing this uh, test can perform the cell sampling procedure um, uh, in our own facility uh, that we lease. The economics of these lucid test centers are very, very attractive. Uh, we used to say that a nurse practitioner can do 20 of these in a day, while our, uh, the other day uh, they did 28 in a day. So um, we, I, uh, as, I was gonna, I'll, as I'll mention a little bit further, but we have a target uh, reimbursement price of $2,000, which is the Medicare price that's been um, approved. Uh, so you can imagine the revenue opportunity per day. It only requires two tests per week for us to break even with these uh, test centers in terms of covering the fixed cost. So it's a very attractive model that we're quite happy with. And we're also working on other um, uh, related um, pathways, as I mentioned, with uh, targeting specialists and, um, and institutions where our nurse practitioners can actually show, go to these facilities and, and perform the test on behalf of, the, of those practices. And we can go into that in more depth. Bottom line is we have a uh, now a robust, well-trained sales rep that has a you know, clear processes for communicating with the, with physicians. We have a network of test centers. We started with seven states in the Western U.S. Um, nine centers. We we recently launched additional four centers in four states, and we're targeting five more before the end of this year. And <clears throat> um, we're looking to help us drive that um, the test volume. Test volume has grown nicely uh, quarter on quarter since we launched the test centers a year ago. Uh, we reported 850 tests performed in the last quarter, which represented 60% growth uh, quarter on quarter, 300% growth year on year. Um, and that that mimicked the, the, the growth rate uh, from, from, from the previous two quarters as well. Um, <clears throat> so that's where we are on the commercial team. On the reimbursement side, uh, we have um, engaged with uh, Medicare. Uh, we have an ongoing engagement with Medicare to secure, um, we've secured, as I said, payment of $1,938, uh, national Medicare payment. We're looking to secure coverage. Uh, that's a process called an LCD, which is um, which is um, ongoing, and we look forward to locking that down soon. On the private payer side, which actually represents about 80% of the tests we're performing today, we're making steady progress. We've announced uh, uh, recently on several occasions that we're uh, locking down um, contractual agreements with preferred provider organizations, PPOs, for ESOGAR to be, for us to be a provider within those networks. And we are collecting some of the clinical util the utility data that the larger centers are requesting, uh, the sort of the larger health plans are requesting for us to get in-network coverage. Um, we've also historically been getting some out-of-network payments um, at, a, at a decent percentage of our, of our total um, Medicare rate. And we look forward to um, uh, to to showing some uh, traction there as well. Um, so that gets me to your to, to to the opening comment as to what's been transformational about the last um, the last quarter and the last couple of weeks. And and that's really two things. Um, I'll emphasize one. Let me just start with is that um, in the past several months, the two major gastroenterology societies, the American College of Gastroenterology or the ACG, and the American Gastroenterologic Association, the AGA both updated their guidelines for the management of patients who have um, heartburn or, at, or at, are, are at risk of developing esophageal precancer and cancer. And they, for the first time, included non-endoscopic, so alternatives to endoscopy, such as ours, in their recommendations. And that's a huge step um, uh, for us because it's a huge milestone for us because it basically put our test um, directly um, uh, as a as an equal alternative to um, <clears throat> to upper endoscopy, I'll point out that we are the only. Uh, although the uh, update to the guidelines was generic, 
it really only reflects us because we were the only uh, company that has a product on the market that fulfills those criteria. So that's a big step. That's an important step for us with regard to our engagement with physicians. It's important, very important, critical, in fact, in our engagements with payers as well that the, that the um, professional societies are recommending um, our products. The second big step, uh, second milestone, the second transformational event over the last couple of quarters is that we completed what was a, what's been about a six to seven month process of transitioning to our own laboratory. So prior to February, we were really dependent on a third party contractor to not just perform the ESOGARD assay in the commercial laboratory, but also um, to bill and submit claims on, on our behalf. <clears throat> And it, it generated quite a complicated contractual arrangement in order to meet various compliance uh, regulations in terms of how um, payments that were made to them um, showed up uh, as, as re recognized revenue for us. We spent the last six months um, uh, making that transition. We acquired our own laboratory. We've transitioned from uh, a management services agreement where they were running it in our laboratory to now we have our entire team that's entirely independent. And perhaps the most important part from the uh, financials, uh, as, as it relates to the financials, is that for the first time this month, we are able to bill directly uh, to pay to bill payers directly as Lucid Diagnostics, as Lucid Diagnostics uh, Labs. And um, for the first time, we're able to not just submit those claims and submit a backlog of about a thousand claims that that we've um, of procedures that we've um, accumulated since uh, since we started this process, but also to aggressively pursue those claims, which the third party contractor had no motivation to do. So there's a lot in terms of um, appealing denials and a variety of other things that you can do that are critical to um, to get to get actual reimbursement. Um, so the key that's a really the key factor. I mean, we I would say um, for people who are looking at us as a um, for the first time, you know the you know, many of the um, um, risks that uh, one would have viewed a couple of years ago with regard to the technology and regulatory matters and others have those boxes have been checked. The main box that's left is reimbursement. It's translating what we've been able to show in terms of sales and sales growth into actual revenue. That requires engagement with with uh, payers, and that that requires what we just um, announced, which is that we are now in a, we now have the ability to do that entirely independently. So I think I'll stop there. I think that uh, hopefully gives a good good overview of um, of our company <clears throat> and where we are um, commercially. I'm happy to um, uh, to answer any questions or dive further into uh, other aspects of it as well. Okay, then. great. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of questions. Uh, if anyone from the audience has questions, feel free to raise your hand and put it in chat. Uh, let me just start giving an opportunity to tell us a little more about the background of the company in terms of the parent, uh, PavMD. Um, what's the relationship there? I think that it's a spinoff, or can you tell us more about that? Uh, no. So PavMed is the parent company, and PavMed is a separately publicly traded company that is a diversified uh, medical technology that operates in, on, on, in devices, in diagnostics, and in digital health. Lucid was founded as a privately held um, subsidiary of PavMed in 2018 as the vehicle to license these technologies. Um, and PavMed took Lucid public in November of last year to raise its own capital. It didn't actually spin it off, although that, you, that word has been used loosely and that it didn't sell any of its shares. PavMed still owns, um, owns a, uh, a large majority stake in Lucid, but Lucid is now a um, separately traded public company that's raised its own capital. Okay. Uh, I don't know, D Dennis, you're there as CFO. Uh, can you give us an idea of like what percentage of the company is owned by PavMed? About 73% uh, PavMed owns of Lucid Diagnostics. Okay, cool. And are are, are they incurring, uh, do they help with any of the operational costs or no, it's just a passive safe? No, it actually is a big, sorry, Dennis, it actually is a central part of the model. So, and it, um, um, it's really an advantage for Lucid. So PavMed, operates as a shared services model with its subsidiary. So <clears throat> much of the centralized administration, R&D, regulatory, a lot of the centralized um, functionalities are actually um, housed at the, at the parent level, <clears throat> which allows uh, economies of scales and a lot of other advantages to, to the subsidiary. So Lucid is, uh, is allowed to focus entirely on its commercial um, activities as well as generating clinical evidence and, and things along those lines. Okay. All right. Great. So I uh, just want a clarification on a few things. When you talk about $1,938 for Medicare, 
Is that for ESOGARD, ESOTREC, or both ESOGARD and ESOTREC combined? Great question. So the it's just ESOGARD. Right, so the billing entity here, we don't charge for ESOCheck. We we provide them. Obviously, our own practitioners use them directly, but physicians who use the test, we provide the ESOCheck device for them to use, and they submit the test. And the entire um, uh, payment is centered around the performance of the molecular diagnostic assay, ESOGuard. So it's ESOGuard that has the billing codes. That we're billing the payers for the performance of the molecular test at that $1,938. Got it. So the ESO check is basically free for them? You provide Correct. that? To, you yeah, we provide it to them. Although uh, the majority of cases these days are being done by our by our practitioners. So it's really just an internal, an internal matter. Uh, I'm going to jump to a question from Sanjay because it seems related. It says, uh, what's the rationale for the Lucid test rationale what's the rationale for the lucid test if the test is easy to perform convenient for patients and doctors if the tests are performed at the doctor's facility i don't even know yeah i think i know what that question is because i get asked that a lot so let me let me just assume that i I think it's the rationale for the lucid test centers so why have our own centers that are performing the test as opposed to having physicians perform the test right and the key quite the key uh, way to answer that is to focus first on the primary care physicians because the other physicians are actually performing the test and the, the it really comes down to the economics of a private pay of, of a private um of sorry of a primary care physician practice right they're in the business of seeing patients every 18 minutes and and with limited staff uh, tight kind of uh, uh, reimbursement and and economics for their practice going into a primary care physician and asking them to It'd be like asking them to perform their own chest x-rays, right? Asking them to perform a, a relatively straightforward procedure. It does require some training, but a straightforward procedure to u- utilize their staff is a huge impediment to adoption. So what we decided is that the, the, the way to get primary care physicians is to, ha- to, to, to order the test and to be engaged is to make it as easy as possible for them and make it uh, certainly not an economic disincentive for them to do so based on sort of their own, u- utilizing their own resources. So that's the um, impetus for the test centers for primary care physicians. Now for gastroenterologists, specialists, for gut surgeons, actually entire community hospitals, large practices, <clears throat> there's a very different dynamic there because they have the resources and the staff to dedicate um, individuals to this. And they also benefit from the economics of pull through of procedures from bringing this uh, bringing this test in, so more endoscopies, more manometry, more pH testing, more CAT scans, more surgery, other things that 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 go to the bottom line. So it's fundamentally an economic um, question about how do you engage with primary care physicians. And as I mentioned, the economics for us of the test center model is is very attractive. It does not, despite what might sort of the initial impression might be with regard to bricks and mortar and capital, it's actually. Uh, quite attractive in terms of it being almost entirely a marginal business. Okay, great. Uh, I want to take into this 1938 reimbursement because um, you mentioned something about that. That's the payment that's negotiated, but you still have to negotiate coverage or something. Exactly, like right. So reimbursement constitutes really three things: coding, which we've got, we we have, we have official coding, payment, which is sort of how much will they pay you, um, and Medicare has has. Um, uh, approved payment of $1,938 nationwide. So that's set. The private payers are actually the, the <clears throat> each one of these private pay contracts that we're negotiating uh, with uh, these PPOs also has a price associated with it. And it's typically a percentage of covered charges and we can't disclose them, but we're quite happy with, with the actual um, uh, private pay um, pricing that we've received so far. Um, coverage is, a, is, a, is the final step in this process, and it's different for Medicare and for private pay. With Medicare, it's much more of a binary thing that the low there's a local coverage determination that that is uh, that is provided by a Medicare contractor that covers your laboratory that says, okay, yeah, we said we're going to pay you nineteen hundred thirty eight dollars. These are the these are the 
people, the, the, these are the patients in whom we'll cover it for. So what are the criteria for a patient to receive coverage uh, under Medicare for this test? Um, there's a similar process with private pay, although that's much more one-on-one. -on -one. It could be an interaction with a small uh, payer. It could be an interaction with a with a with a self-insured union or company. There's a, it's much more kind of blocking and tackling step by step than it is with Medicare. But as I said, 80% of our patients so far are private pay, and um, um, so that's you know that's that's where we're focusing a lot of our attention day to day. So how how's that translate into revenue and timing of revenue? Yeah, I see in your press release you said you have 850 tests performed in Q2, but there was no revenue recorded. It, it, can you explain why that is or- Yeah, you get Dennis, coverage? wait, you want to take that, take that over? Yeah. Sure thing. So uh, early on in reimbursement, because of the uncertainty of what the payment rates are gonna be for a submitted claim and whether it'll be denied, the gap rules require us to recognize revenue based upon cash collections. In the last quarter, the quarter ended June 30th, we um, began with our own laboratory and we hired a revenue cycle management company, which most laboratories have. And once the back office operations were set up on August 1st, we were able to start billing for the accumulated tests since we had our own lab, which essentially was March 1st. So on August 1st, we started to bill about a thousand tests uh, to third party payers no collections in the second quarter, therefore no revenue recognized under those gap rules. We will recognize revenue as, um, as claims are paid. And at some point in the future, when it becomes highly probable that a submitted claim of 1938 gets paid at 1938, then the rules, gap rules will change and we'll start recognizing revenue when an invoice is sent, not when uh, revenue is collected. Hopefully that was pretty clear. And it sounds like, but you can go back and bill for tests starting. We will, March. and oh, yeah. and yeah, we yeah. have. Yeah. yeah, you have a year. You have a year uh, to to uh, to submit claims. Okay, and and what's the timing as far as the the coverage? When are you going to get a, a final decision on coverage from Medicare? You mean Medicare or the private pay? So as I said, oh, uh, private pay is yeah on Medicare un unclear. So there was a a process. Uh, it's hard to predict uh, how um, you know, the timing with regard to to, to Medicare. The, I can tell you what the process was. The process was in the second quarter in the in the spring. Uh, there was a flurry of activity around a proposed draft coverage determination. That was the first we heard from Medicare in 18 months, to be to be frank. Um, and that process, um, that triggered a public comment process, which we were engaged with, along with 12 other, a dozen or so other allied entities and um, um, across the country and key opinion leaders. That public comment period, including written comments and open meetings, were completed both for two different Medicare um, contractors, and now they're, they're reviewing. And so, we don't have a set date as to when that review will come back. In the meantime, we're collecting what we know to be an important part of getting that coverage, which is um, so-called clinical utility data. Data, a real world use data where we can show that when a patient, when this test is ordered, the result of the test actually has an impact on medical decision-making. That is the fundamental question that both private and uh, payers and Medicare want to know that if they're paying for this test, how is it affecting medical decision-making? So that the, that's data we're currently collecting. We now have a su sufficient volume of tests to be able to do that. And so by the time we com complete complete that, we're hoping that uh, that will be uh, the time that we started, we hear back from Medicare and able to provide that data to get coverage. The private pay side, again, is very different, right? Uh, private pay is not binary. It's one plan one PPO uh, at a time. There's no blanket um, payment or coverage. And that's something we're currently chipping away at it quite nicely in that we're getting on uh, various PPO networks. Um, we expect that those submissions will get paid. We're also getting, we've also historically been paid out of network. Any of you guys who, anybody on this call who's, you know, been dealt with medical bills knows, knows that if you're out of network, there is still your, your, your insurance will still provide some level of coverage for that, typically at the 50% rate. So we expect to get out of network uh, payments, uh, even in uh, for payers that we don't have a in-network contract with. But again, none of that was really uh, able to come on the radar until this month. 
uh, because we were not in a position until this month to be able to submit claims uh, to private payers and work our way through out of network payments and beginning to engage oh. with on the pri- on the in network side. So this 850 test performed. Are any of those Medicare patients or you're yet? Yeah, on average, historically, we've been running about 20 percent Medicare. Yeah. Okay, so even That's though right. you don't have that coverage decision, you're still providing that. Oh, absolutely. Benefit. Yeah, we have to do that because. This is the system. I mean, I say this is not the way I would invent a healthcare system, but it's the healthcare system we have that you that in order to get to engage with both Medicare and with private pay, you have to effectively subsidize a certain volume of testing until you've developed a let's let's talk about private pay, for example. If we're to go to we have done a decent number of cases in Arizona because that's where we started our our um, lucid test centers. If we're to go to United Blue Cross of Arizona and say, "Hey, we have this new test. We'd like we'd like uh, coverage at it. This is where we we'd like the what we would propose to a price." Until we and they're like, "We've never heard of this test. Show have we have you actually submitted any claims? Have we have we paid any claims? Have we paid any claims out of network? Have we denied any claims?" You the system requires us to generate a claims history, which requires us to actually do tests, um, um, and that's that's. But every diagnostic company has to go through, and that's what we're going through right now. Okay. So then, uh, give, if you can give, give a little color to this, because you said you can retrospectively go back to March and, and bill. Is that for the private side or Medicare or both? For both. Yeah. So, so what's that? How far back can, because you don't have that coverage decision yet. Let's say that coverage decision, I don't know, comes a year from now, you can still go back and bill from March. We can bill, we can bill a year back from that. My understanding is that we can bill a year back, but you know, our volume is growing, right? So, so the, mm-hmm. the, the, the 12 year lagging uh, volume that we'll be able to bill for is, is, um, um, you know, would, would likely be more greater than what we have now. Um, so right mm-hmm. now, the number of Medicare cases that are backlogged is relatively modest because it's only about 20% of our volume. Mm-hmm. So, so what's going to be kind of the inflection point in you guys being able to recognize revenue? Uh, is it is it when Medicare says, "Hey, you got we got the coverage decision all finalized"? Is that when you know your payments? When really we receive revenue, as Dennis mentioned, is when we receive revenue, right? You receive so, it, right? But yeah, so we we expect a- to get paid out of network. Um, Dennis, maybe you can give a little bit of color on what the history was with uh, with with Research GX. We expect to get paid out of network. We expect to get paid following claims, prosecutions, and and um, appealing denials. And we we expect to get paid through these preferred provider organizations that we're we're um, we're locking up on a regular on a regular basis. Do you want to add a little bit to that, Dennis? To yeah, the third party contracting lab that we used up through February twenty fifth was submitting claims and getting paid on some of those claims at out-of-network rates. And those out-of-network rates ranged between $1,100 to $1,300 per test, the ones that they got paid for, which is 50 to 60% of the list price, typical out-of-network amounts. Using that as a proxy for what might be expected for out-of-network, there is some portion of the claims that we will submit we said there's roughly a thousand since we took over the lab it's slightly higher than that we'll submit those claims some of those claims will be paid at out of network rates we will see what that is the submissions just occurred here just a couple weeks ago and in the ensuing weeks we'll see which portion gets paid at out of network rates and those that get denied Unlike the third party contracting lab, we will be able to appeal. And the appeal process is a vibrant uh, portion of trying to get coverage in place. Once you submit claims, you start to appeal, you become more engaged with these independent uh, insurance companies. That's all part of the process of developing a coverage contract between the company and, uh, and, and the insurance company. I just want to make sure the straight answer to your question is clear, Ben. When we when we start receiving, for example, out of network payments, when we get receipts, we all recognize that revenue. Yeah. But you know, so so that's we're not we don't recognizing revenue is not dependent on coverage. It's dependent on the cash receipts we get from uh, even from out of from out of network payments, which are not uh, under some coverage umbrella. And the bottom line, and even further, we will get paid for some of these claims, even without coverage policies in place. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. But it, it does seem a little bit complicated for us uh, being outside the company. To We can't like take this press release and say, okay, 850 tests, 
times 2000 and that's going to be a revenue. It doesn't really work that way. No, you not, not yet. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have some time to <laughs> it will. develop it runway, right now, yeah, but not right now. That, yeah. That's absolutely okay. correct. Yeah. So can you give us a little you bit can talk of about revenue power. opportunity, certainly, and then take some, right. you know, basically the revenue opportunity on 850 tests is 1.7 million. So at some point, right. some percentage of that will, 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 will start seeing uh, receipts on that, and we'll start recognizing some revenue on that. And I and I would encourage you to look at the re, at the the test volume growth as well, because you know that's right. there. There's you know, what, that what is, is the growth? You gave us a number earlier. It was sixty percent right. quarter on quarter um, uh, for the last two quarters, and three hundred percent year uh, on an annual basis. Sixty percent sequential growth, and and do you think that's going to continue at that clip? Increase, decrease over the next year or two. Oh, I think we'll continue to grow. Yeah. So one of the things that we're trying to balance, frankly, which you sort of hinted at, is that we want to, you know, we are, we're in a position where we're, we we do want to be cognizant of our runway and our cash position, right? And until we receive a little bit more predictable um, paths with regard to reimbursement, we are going to, to what we've um, announced is we're going to grow our sales team and through the end of the year and just kind of run with that stable of of horses that we have at the end of the year with a team, you know, 60 person team, which is really uh, substantial. There's about four months from when you hire a new rep till they become sort of fully functional in the field and are able to generate their own um, referrals and test volume. So we think there's plenty of upside, even with, um, um, you know, continuing our growth till the end of the year and plateauing from there. Uh, Dennis, can you give a little bit of color or guidance on, on how many quarters maybe from now will you, you be in a position to be able to have more clarity to say, hey, we have X number of tests and you can figure X percent of them are going to be covered and you, this is our average reimbursement rate. Like how long till we have that kind of clarity so we can do the math on a number of tests? It really comes down to when reimbursement will become um, much clearer than it is now. There is a transition period we're going through. That could be a couple quarters. Um, it could be a year. Um, but during that period of time, we will be collecting claims, um, and some of them will be paid at uh, different rates over that period of time. Um, you asked about growth in terms of procedures. The, um, the sales force that was calling on the primary care physicians at the beginning of last quarter was a total of 10. As Lishan said, we're going to continue to grow that through the end of the year. That group will be four times that by the end of the year. So that gives you some indication of our expectation of how procedure growth is going to occur between now and the end of the year and into next year. And it also, during that 12 month period of time, we are optim optimistic that the, the coverage landscape will change positively as well. It's really difficult to predict when that'll occur. We are putting the things in place today, which is activity and claim submission which um, will lead to the engagement. And we're seeing some of that early on with these PPO contracts that we've announced and others that we're expecting to announce before too long. Okay. So uh, I'm wondering if you've done, you may have some goals. I don't know. We, we can't say what it is, right? What the actual reimbursement rate will be and all that. We we don't know like what percent or the actual numbers. You mean, right? you mean as a percentage of the, you mean what, uh, uh, as a, as a matter of kind of list price and what we expect our contracts to be, we're not looking to, to go for below Medicare. <laughs> so just to be yeah. clear about that, right. that, that Medicare is the floor and our conversations with private payers are um, to, to be at or above the Medicare rate. Right. Right. Now, but I'm sure you have a percentage some sort of... of what our average, yeah, sorry, the average reimbursement from a claims. We don't, we don't have that yet. And we're not okay. providing okay. guidance for that. So what, what I'm trying to get to is, do you have any kind of uh, modeling or goals in, in terms of how many tests do you think you need to be doing per quarter to get to a place where you're cash flow neutral? Yeah, you can, you can do that, Matt, using our last press release as a proxy for that. We publish in the press release non-GAAP financials. And the non-GAAP, when you take out the non-cash uh, the, the, the non expenses, stock-based compensation, depreciation, amortization, those sorts of things. And in that press release, you'll see that Lucid Diagnostics for the third, for second quarter had a uh, $10 million loss. And so if that is your baseline and you're trying to determine what break even is, the only way to factor that is to look at the 1938, which that payment rate's been established by CMS 
and you look at the margins, this is a very profitable procedure. You can think about 80 to 90 percent uh, gross margins. So if you use 85 percent, you divide the 10 million by the by by that uh, gross profit, you're talking about around 6,000 tests. Now there's assumptions in that, right? We know the payment rate at 1938. We don't know what the transition payments are going to be, but with coverage, and we're optimistic, we will get coverage and we will get coverage that 1938. You can then look at the number of tests at the full CMS rate and at those gross margins that will take to break even. And that's around 6,000 tests per quarter. Okay. I, can I just make one comment, Ben? Because I think, you know, uh, it's important that we go through the the, the short-term sort of quarter-to-quarter -quarter expectations, but I'm not sure I've fully emphasized what the what the overall market opportunity is here because, you know, the numbers like Dennis is talking about, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of procedures is just scratching the surface. The total population, the target population, based on existing guidelines, not because we're, we say so, but because of based on existing guidelines and the updated guidelines have increased the target population from 13 million to 30 million patients who are recommended for screening. Um, that is, uh, so you can do the math, that's a big number. Um, and this is the know. only test that's available. For Absolutely, people. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so for us to reach numbers that, that generate meaningful, um, uh, revenue and revenue growth for a company at our stage, we literally have to barely scratch the surface of that total to get to those kinds of numbers. So I just didn't want to 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 leave without some some um, you know it's, it's great to talk about the short term, but some um, a little bit of emphasis as to what you know how huge the long term opportunity is here. Okay, so the the last thing I want to get to is in terms of capital. Uh, and runway and capital, you're gonna. It looks like you're gonna have to raise raise more capital. I, I wonder if you can share what your strategy and approach you're gonna take to doing that. Um, yeah, Dennis, would you mind? Uh, yeah, taking yeah. That one? sure thing. There, there are plenty of levers that are available to us, but to set the stage, remember, PavMed owns seventy plus percent of Lucid, and up through the IPO, PavMed financed all of the operations for Lucid and has that ability to do so in the future. PathMed has $65 million in cash. There's 32, 33 million of that at June 30th at Lucid from the IPO. And we've already established from one of your earlier questions that the Lucid burn using the non-GAAP number is around 10 million. So you have the parent company that can help fund the operations. The 33 million is almost a year's worth of cash. There's more at the parent company, but a couple key things are relevant. At the Lucid level, there is a $50 million committed equity facility, which there is a, um, a group that is committed to buy up to $50 million of Lucid stock that we can decide when to do so. That is one of the levers. At the parent level, in addition to the 65 million of cash at June 30th, there's a committed $22 million unfunded uh, uh, convertible debt that is available to us. And it's uh, under certain conditions, we can have that additional capital at the parent level. Also at the parent level, there is a $275 million shelf and embedded in that is a 50 million ATM. So there are quite a few levers that we can use to finance operations. And one of the things we'll be judicious about is with inflection points that are upcoming, largely related to uh, increasing the volume of tests, uh, increasing coverage with reimbursement as we continue to uh, engage with the insurance companies, we'll try and raise cash when needed, either from the parent to the subsidiary or using Lucid's own resources at uh, the appropriate time. So no immediate needs to do need to do anything, but those uh, those tools are available to the company, both at the parent company and the subsidiary. The, uh, can you just comment a little more on that fifty million dollar committed equity facility? Uh, I, I don't know what's public about that, but what are what are some of the main? Yeah, terms there, of that? there's plenty of details in our quarterly report about it. Uh, it was announced in. Uh, in uh, March of this year uh, with our earnings call that. Uh, Cantor Fitzgerald, through one of their affiliates, 
has committed to purchase up to $50 million of Lucid stock at times we deem appropriate at our election. Um, there are a, limits to it on a daily basis, but generally- it's a, okay. And it's attractive terms, on, yeah. you know, by, by all, by any stretch of the imagination. Are there like warrants the in there? Or no, I was going to say no them. warrants, minimal discounts. It's, it, yeah. they're, they're very attractive terms. So 4% <laughs> right. discount we'll to, in, the, in the agreement. Yeah. We'll have to look into that. That's the, that's the main thing, you know, we got to look out for when investing in small yeah. companies. Yeah, we understand. Yeah, we're we're quite happy, and we've had good luck over the years in terms of uh, we, we haven't issued warrants in the parent company. I don't know, Dennis, in a long years, time. A long time. We know we know that route. We know the pain associated with that, and um, uh, you know these these facilities are all quite quite um, uh, issuer friendly and therefore investor friendly. Okay, we we have to go because we have an update on another stock. We're going to take ten minutes to do to take us into the program. There are a couple other questions we didn't get to. It, uh, would we be able to do some email follow-ups with these additional? Absolutely, questions? yeah. Uh, okay. uh, Adrian, do you want to just chime in and give your email address, and we can uh, people can contact you directly? Yeah, they can contact me at uh, akm at pavmed.com. That's Adrian from uh, Investor Relations. Eh? Right, that's Adrian. great. Yep. Okay. All right, great. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Yeah, awesome thanks, man. Great, really appreciate yep. it. Thanks, everyone. Right. For joining. Right now. Yep. Good luck.